Welcome to CHI's Masters of Suspicion, where in week three, the literary transformations of the world. A little review from last week. We discussed the importance of Irving's rambling logic as a lifestyle that remains simultaneously open to the gifts of the surrounding world and skeptical of ideologies that trap us into myopic conceptions of reality. This, in part, is predicated on a soft understanding of truth, one that disavows authorities that would attempt to fix the truth into one dominant conception. Irving's rambling logic in this way coincides with 21st century sociology, much of which substantiates, substantiates ways authority controls definitions of truth and prioritizes certain forms of knowledge in order to maintain their control over so social order. Anybody who's been reading any of the editorials about the new president of the University of Iowa will be very, very familiar with certain kinds of truth, certain kinds of knowledge, certain understandings of the world, and how that relates to authority and power. It's the same thing that Irving's talking about. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Irving demonstrates not only how, to, how remaining open to a multiplicity of truths helps us maintain a skeptical stance against authority, but also how it enlivens our experiences. The Gothic became an intentional filter over reality that opened up a pleasurable and unreal way to experience one's life. By translating one's experiences into Gothic tropes, Cran was able to experience a place through a work of co-creation that avoided the perils of imperialization. He was able to find a home in the world's strangeness instead of projecting his home into the places that where he found himself. Rip Van Winkle offered a different use of the Gothic, its ability to provide a sense of truth that varied from authority. On the one hand, Irving shows how a semblance of authority causes doubts to give way and for absurd stories to attain the status of truth through widespread communal acceptance, right? And that would be the ancestor of the historian Peter Vanderdonk who started shaking his head and then everybody's like, oh, great, well, I guess we can believe Rip now, where before we didn't, right? The grandson of the historian spoke. That's all the authority. And people want that authority, right? And that's part of what Irving's telling us, too. People long for somebody in authority to tell them what truth is and what it means so they don't have to take the responsibility themselves. themselves. Irving doesn't want that. So on the other hand, he shows how remaining open to multiple possibilities of truth serves as a site of resistance against both the communal and authoritarian control of truth. The best attitude, or at least the one that he seems to recommend, is to have a light hold on truth, to accept any truth provisionally with a wink. Doing so allows us to participate in a world guided by logics that aren't conducive to rambles, which helps us recognize patterns like King George becoming George Washington that control society without our having rips of blindness to it. Right? You don't want to be in an ivory tower refusing to acknowledge the pattern that governed the world or in whatever you know, like off-the-grid place that you want to be. It, it's useful to know how the world works. It's not useful to become trapped to it and blind about it. Does, does that make sense? And that's part of what Irving's pushing us to understand, I think. Um, finally, Irving shows the amount of joy we can find when we relax about the need to control truth. And that's more of what we'll dig into today. So this week, um, we're going to look more about the importance of literature in guiding a rambling lifestyle. The spur for this is how Irving depicts Crayon's travels through Stratford-upon-Avon. My assumption is that much of Irving's depth that emerges when he's depicting Christmas, how many of you read the Christmas chapters? Just beautiful, aren't they? I've never loved Christmas as much as I did through Irving. I've always kind of dreaded it in my own way because it's not, it's not a relaxing holiday. But the way Irving describes living Christmas was the most inspirational thing I've ever found about Christmas. It's beautiful. But how he gets to there, I think, comes more clear when reading Stratford upon <coughs> Avon. It's rooted in his engagements that become explicit only in this later sketch. So focusing on this story, I'm hoping will allow you to go back and read or reread through the earlier passages and glean better ways to live that provoke the world into becoming a brighter and more interesting place. So that's the goal. Here we go. Stratford-upon-Avon. Um, Stratford-upon-Avon is, of course, the home of Shakespeare, whose influence on Irving is unmistakable, especially here. He starts the sketch on page 224 by centering the reader in a homeless position. Quote, to a homeless man who has no spot on this wide world which he can truly call his own, there is a momentary feeling of something like independence and territorial consequence when he stretches himself before an infire. And again, just pause. When, when you go back and look at it again, just look at what he means by that term truly. 
especially after you look at what truth means in Rip Van Winkle. To truly call one's own. We, we, there's nothing we truly can call our own. And that's his, that's his reminder, right? All of us are truly homeless if we admit it to ourselves. So, um, again, if you, if you put yourself in the position of readers right after the revolution when the book came out, I mean, it was uh, the early 1900s, um, or I'm sorry, early 1800s, to, to readers who had un recently undertaken a revolution for independence in order to gain their own land, a lot of this language would sound familiar. Nonetheless, Irving reinforces the importance of what is transitory. Not only is the man homeless, but the feeling of independence and territorial consequence is momentary. It's a fleeting pleasure, not something that ought to be seized upon or clenched. It's also not something that demands violence. It can be attained simply by stretching out in front of a fire. And this is, I think, like the truth that readers were invited to embrace when re uh, reading Knickerbocker's account of Rip Van Winkle. First, because it's a feeling that might arise when one is open to it, but it's not necessarily something that should be willed through authority. Second, the fact that he's at, in front of an inn fire, it's a public space that's open to all, shows where such temptations to make things permanent emerge. To have a home is a human desire. To be at home, even in the public places of the world, is an ethical way to satisfy the feeling. Right? And so, the, the, again, the contrast is, to, is, is between making a play, making a space your home and being at home in places. Right? If you're able to see something as a place, and allow yourself to be at home in that place, that's different than looking at any space as an empty space that's just there for you to project yourself into. This is the logic of imperialism, right? Where you can divide the whole world into empty grids that you can build up or transform or level or dam or do whatever you want to, cut down trees, fill them in, plant them, whatever. That's looking at, that, at Earth as a space. Place is something that has its own peculiar significance. Okay? And that's, I think, the ethical lesson that Irving's trying to point out. And an inn can be a place, right? And it can be a place where you can, like, push yourself into and, like, buy up or whatever. But it can also be a place where you can allow yourself to be at home instead of making that space into your home. Does that distinction make sense? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so he is, as he continues the paragraph, quote, for the time <laughs> being, the very monarch of all he surveys, the armchair is his throne, the poker his scepter, and the little parlor, some 12 feet square, his undisputed empire. It's a morsel of certainty snatched from the midst of the uncertainties of life, end quote. Here, Irving once again shows the attraction and ridiculousness of power. It's great to feel like a ruler, so one is one who remains humble about it. A 12-foot square empire, of course, is nothing to brag about. Um, but, but he does. He feels it. And it feels good, but it's momentary. And that's the important thing. Crayon's humility is, is additionally confirmed in the next paragraph when, quote, there was a gentle tap at the door and a pretty chambermaid inquired whether I had wrong. I understood it as a modest hint that it was time to retire. My dream of absolute dominion was at an end. So abdicating my throne to avoid being deposed, I went to bed. It's an idle dream, this dream of mastery and empire. And it's one that Crayon is fine with playing with, right? He can dream himself into the space of ruling the way he can dream himself into a Gothic space. And it's okay, but it's all fantasy. He knows that it's fantasy. And it's okay to have those fantasies as long as with all truths, all certainties, all uncertainties, all dreams, he's willing to let it go with a smile which he does. He abdicates his throne, and he goes to bed. Put otherwise is a final twist. The irony Irving incorporates into the statement, the fact that Crayon is not, in fact, an absolute monarch of a space intended for temporary occupation, discloses how certainty, like truth, is predicated on one's assumptions about how certainty is defined. Irving accommodates the drive for certainty through temporary occurrences that outsiders would not find certain at all, 
right? It'd be ridiculous to say that the, that feeling like you're the emperor of a, an empire is certain, right? The, the, there's nothing certain about that. It's just this feeling that you're like, ah, I'm the only one here. I can stretch out and kick my feet up and do whatever I want. I can take my shoes off even if I want. Nobody will tell me otherwise. I can do that. You know, and, and it feels good, but most people wouldn't call that certainty. Irving has a broader sense of certainty the way he has a broader sense of truth. And it allows Crayon to have that as a moment of certainty, just recognizing that feeling as it emerges, but not needing to cling to it beyond that moment. And expanding his sense of what's certain allows him to avoid succumbing to any sort of despair where nothing is certain. He has a momentary certainty. He snatches that morsel out, but then he can let it go again instead of clinging to it. It's that act of clinging that creates problems, not enjoying it when the feeling emerges. That's what I think Irving is trying to point out. So we can satisfy the drive a moment at a time, so long as we properly understand who we are and what it is that we desire. Irving's inclusion of the fact that it's just a morsel of certainty snatched from the midst of the uncertainties of life helps readers understand the motivation for power is certainty. Life is an uncertain business, especially when, at least deep down, we recognize the truth of our homelessness and the contingency of our lives and existence. It's this basic feeling of homelessness that creates a desire for ownership and mastery, even if we don't always examine this as a motivation. Understanding such moments as morsels allows us to respond to the feeling like a gift, not as though it's a right. We can receive a morsel of certainty and gratitude without working to own it through the acquisition of power and property. The best lives are those that, with humility, remain able to relinquish their illusions as readily as they're gained. And I think that this is one of the gifts of the Gothic that Irving wants readers to be able to embrace. Making sense so far? Okay. Irving's next task is to focus readers on the importance of literature. Crayon is not the absolute master of his domain. His contemplation occurs while put the words of sweet, sweet Shakespeare are just passing through his mind as this clock struck midnight from the tower of the church in which he lies buried, end quote. The midnight hour, the burial ground, and the tower all put a, that nice, subtle, gothic twist on the remembered words that he's just kind of musing through in his mind. The fact of these words are important guides to him. They're buried in his memory, and they help to explain why he dreamt all night of Shakespeare. And they also serve to orient the reader to the literary journey that he's about to undertake. On page 225, he calls it a poetical pilgrimage. It's one that has a universal appeal because literature has a universal appeal. Literature is an empire that doesn't conquer through force or death. It conquers through life and giving life to everybody openly to those who'd accept it. Here's what, here's what Irving says, quote, and he's describing uh, Shakespeare's home. The walls of its squalid chamber are covered with names and inscriptions in every language by pilgrims of all nations, ranks, and conditions, from the prince to the peasant, and present a simple but striking instance of the spontaneous and universal homage of mankind to the great poet of nature. End quote. This gestures to the widespread appeal of poetry, a dominion that is not exclusive or owned the way that poetry can't be owned, right? Pilgrims come to honor the poet due to the power of language and ideas, not through the force of will or arms. Poetry and literature to be able to, are able to be owned and appropriated by everyone, at all times. It's not something zero-sum the way that land is. It's open. It's a gift. There are no have-nots in the world of literature. Its property isn't something that meant to be admired, and again, Crayon describes the house as a small, mean-looking edifice of wooden plaster, right? I mean, this is not a gorgeous architecture. It's nothing like that. But what he does instead is use it to, to remember that genius, quote, seems to delight in hatching its offspring in by corners, end quote. I mean, Shakespeare didn't go to Montessori, right? I mean, he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he, he wasn't a child not left behind. He didn't necessarily pass all the tests in the right order. He was in a by corner, and his genius flourished despite his mean-looking hovel that he grew up in. And that hovel, because of his ability to convey words powerfully and ideas powerfully through words, creates a new home. It's a new center of empire, but it's one that people can freely, freely choose to enter or exit as they will. 
It's a different way of understanding power. Is that making sense? <coughs> All right. So what I want to argue is that the delight of the home is more material than it is spiritual. Materiality, again, is the truest home, I think, of the Gothic. It's not the specters. It's not the external ghost. It's the internal hosts that are most bothersome. It's the bodies. It's the chambers and the brain, the materiality of us, not our empty thoughts, going back to the first week in Dickinson. So given that, here's how he describes what things he finds. And again, for those of you who took the, the summer class on Heidegger, things and materiality are huge, necessary, and important concrete anchors of what world means. We can't have a world without things. So here's the thingliness of this world. He encounters a series of artifacts thanks to the assistance of a garrulous <coughs> old lady who is, quote, peculiarly assiduous in exhibiting the relics with which this, like all other celebrated shrines, abounds, including, quote, the shattered sock of the very matchlock which Shakespeare shot the deer, his tobacco box, which proves he was a rival smoker of Sir Walter Raleigh, the sword with which he also played Hamlet, the identical lantern with which Friar Lawrence discovered Romeo and Juliet at the tomb, and an ample supply also of Shakespeare's mulberry tree, which seems to have as extraordinary powers of self-multiplication as the wood of the true cross, of which there is enough extent to build a ship of the line. <laughs> right? They're all things. And, and his adjectives highlight the certainty of the presented objects whose importance arises less from historical circumstance than the interplay connecting presentation and acceptance, right? So they're presented as the real thing, the way the wood of the true cross is the real thing. This is really that wood. And there's no way to disprove it. There's no reason to believe it. But like he wants to do, he accepts it. He accepts its materiality as something important. And in a way, the shrine of that space hallows those objects and makes them true, given his belief in those objects, the way that any relic in any church would make something true simply by its presentation. It's there for him to accept as such, however absurd, bizarre, or in, uh, illogical it would be to accept it as such. So, um, and, and this is, what I want to do is contrast these kinds of relics to the dittos, like Rip's son, whose uncanny identity across time inspires horror, right? Rip is horrified to see a copy of himself answering to Rip when he, when he comes back into the village. These identical objects Unlike that, inspire delight and joy. They just require a believing acceptance. Crayon accepts the object's invitation to imagine and dwell in a pool of possibilities, although he makes it clear that this is done through making belief. It's an activity, again, as important in poetic sites as religious ones, and I don't even know that Irving would constitute a difference between those necessarily either. Um, Note how Crayon's adjectives also help readers understand how to make believe. It's done the way that we want to believe Riff's story. Even if there's every reason to doubt the claims about the objects, the joy comes in overcoming the dictates of reason and believing anyway. That's where the joy enters, and the world becomes a more beautiful place thereby. Questions? Can you speak a little bit more about... Uh... Irving maybe not, maybe collapsing like <coughs> poetic and religious imagination. I mean, I'd look at some of his stuff on Christmas or the way that he treats Westminster Abbey or other religious sites, mm -hmm. the way he looks at truth and authority and all of that. I mean, for him, and I haven't done a lot of research on his actual relationship to religion, so this is just mostly having read the book a few times and really thinking about what that means. But it seems like his desire for Christmas is not looking at Jesus Christ as the one true son of God. You know, it's not about the authority of that. It's not even about the, tr the religious traditions about it. But Christmas is something beautiful and honorable and holy anyway. But its holiness isn't predicated in God. It's predicated in accepting the world that it brings forth. All right. Does, does that make sense? That's, yeah. that's probably the quickest yeah. answer I can do. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Throughout the rest of this sketch, Irving lists a series of hints that allow readers to understand how to allow literature to affect a transformation of the world. The first step, as above, comes through a willingness to engage corporeally with the surrounding world of matter and things. So not just sitting back and thinking about it, but really engaging corporeally with the material objects around you. Things matter, in other words. 
Thus, Crayon pauses it, quote, the most favorite object of curiosity, Shakespeare's chair. The chair rests in a chimney nook, and Crayon imagines the young Shakespeare watching meat cook or overhearing, quote, the cronies and gossips of Stratford dealing forth churchyard tales and legendary anecdotes of the troublesome times of England, end quote. Just as the sails of ships inspired his imagination at the young age, so also do material artifacts anchor and inspire his fancies as an adult. Such objects call to his imagination, localizing his thoughts, inspiring his unproductive idols, <coughs> and gracing his world with uncertain delights. <coughs> Momentarily appropriating the space, Crane is told that, quote, In this chair, it is the custom of everyone that visits the house to sit. Whether this be done with the hope of imbibing any of the inspiration of the bard, I am at a loss to say. I merely mention the fact, and mine host has privately assured me that, though built of solid oak, such was the fervent zeal of devotees, that the chair had to be new bobbed at least once in three years. You know, so a philosopher might look at what actually makes the chair Shakespeare's chair if it gets a new bottom every three years. At least, right? Is that how is that still Shakespeare's chair? It is because of where it is. And it is because that's where the pilgrims who visit the site want it to be. That's it. That's what makes it his chair. And that's all. It's the place that makes the chair, not the chair that makes the place. And again, recognizing this, living this way, being able to be home at places, allows that chair to gain its power. And it's, it gains that power, particularly for people who allow themselves to be inspired by literature. But not inspired in ways that just let you sit back and just abstractly muse about it. But, but it's really to let you interact with that world and that world of things that Shakespeare inhabited. Whether that the actual thing is the same thing or not is unimportant. It's the fact of its situation that's important. And a willingness to be a reader of the world the way that one's a reader of texts and engage in the world in that beautiful way. Is that, is that clear? Okay. So, um, <laughs> Irving indicates that the seat allows visitors to engage in a bodily appropriation of the site. And again, so instead of viewing an object or remaining distance from it the way you would at a museum where it's like cordoned off or something like that, um, an occupation of the seat endows the occupant with true visions of legendary anecdotes at the barn's board. <laughs> The chair's unique possibilities arise from the conflation of story and thingliness, but leave it up to each individual actor to choose whether or not to welcome its invitations. Nobody has to sit in the chair. You can. And if you do, it can change things because your body's engaged in it. You bring your own personal weight and gravity into that world and appropriate that world as you sit. There's a power that's present. But it, again, it's not the kind of present power that's often recognized in the world. It's a power of whimsy. It's the power of delight and the power of wonder. It's a power that invites what is childish within us to participate with it in the co-creation of the world. It's the power of make-believe that every child knows how to do. And it's one that we're still invited to do, even as we've aged. It's still there. It's still something latent within us that we can always call forth to emerge. Even if it's impossible, one is nonetheless able to see these artifacts as the kinds of things that anchor Shakespeare's world and to accept one's momentary spot in inhabiting this place in that way. To do it as if one were Shakespeare. Because why not? It's delightful. All right. So after encountering the relics, Irving provides Crayon with a succinct formula for the rambling lifestyle that depends on a Gothic logic that perpetuates possibilities at the expense of property and certainty. This provides what I would call a second step, the method for interacting with the material world in a, that brings it to life. He writes, quote, I am always of easy faith in such matters and am ever willing to be deceived where the deceit is pleasant and costs nothing. I am therefore a ready believer in relics, legends, and local anecdotes of goblins and great men and would advise all travelers who travel for the gratification to do the same. What is it to us, whether these stories be true or false, so long as we can persuade ourselves into the belief of them and enjoy all the charm of their reality? It's our own work of self-persuasion, right? We're not, being, we're not being advertised to. We persuade ourselves. We're conscious of the work of persuading ourselves. And that's what lets us be free in doing so. 
question about that? Yeah. What do you mean by their own reality? Yes. You know, is this kind of a platonic reality? It's it's a Heideggerian reality. And, and, and reality is his word. I, I mean, the reality of the chair, it's real in the sense that it's material. I mean, that's one definition of reality, right? This chalkboard is real. Yeah, but, but as you said before, this thing has been redone so many times that you know, it could be proved that it was not the chair. It was, I think you say it's the place, but, uh, but you know, it's more the idea that there was a chair there and that that is a fact. That might not even be, they, like, it might not even actually be Shakespeare's house. Nobody really knows. Like, the house might have burned down four times. It might be a total recreation. It might be a marketing play from 400 years ago. I don't know. Irving doesn't know. But what matters, what's important, again, is he says, it's not whether these stories be true or false, so long as we can persuade ourselves into the belief of them. Right? It's real because it's material. And it's real because it's anchored into a world that invites us into it, but not the way that our world does, where we just assume we're projected into it. We're thrown into this world of banks and ATMs and fines and courts and police and you know, advertising and Chick-fil-A or whatever, right? I mean, there's all of this that we just assume into our world. And we don't have the same kind of choice. We have to learn how to be suspicious of that world before we can choose what we enter into. A lot of people don't do that, right? They mire themselves in TV shows and movies that keep them spinning in this world without thinking. What Irving's saying is that <coughs> the reality of this world is one that you opt into. You persuade yourself into the belief of it. Because there's no cost. It costs nothing. The deceit is pleasant, right? Be of easy faith in such matters. Enjoy it. And even if your rational mind says it's preposterous, there's still a world here that's beckoning to you to enter into and engage bodily. Sit down in the chair. Be the bard. Listen to the stories. Hear them in your mind. And that's what he's saying. It's a different way of understanding the reality of the world. And if you're of easy faith, the world opens itself in beautiful and new ways. Does, does that make more sense? You, you don't have to agree with them, but do you, do you understand his argument? Well, it kind of reminds me of, of Artie Johnson's line. He said in, uh, in, in, what was it? Very interesting, but not so true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, but the, yeah, there is a world of ideas. Mm -hmm. right? So, so the idea of, of, and you could say that that's Plato's work. You know, that that things exist because they are in that. Well, um, but whereas Plato said that the real real is the ideal, right? And for Plato, the idea of a chair is more real than the chair. Yeah, right. That's Plato's line. What, what I like about what Heidegger does with world, part of why I started with Heidegger this summer, is that he says, no, no, that's not, really, that's not really how we work as humans, right? There's something real about the chair, and the world is anchored in the things. It can't exist without tangible things that we interact with, with without car keys and bikes and winter coats and flagpoles, right? I mean, these make our world what our world is. And, and so you have something real there that, that's just thingly. Right? And they anchor and grab us to it. We also have a social world that lies over this real world. We have, two, we have a lot of ways that we experience world, right? And so what is the world of the social world of, of talking and language? And, and all of this, for Heidegger, really is rests in words. But when you have the possibility of a little pocket world, just think of it as, a, as just a little nestled out world in the middle of the surrounding world, right? You go to Shakespeare's house, it's not the big world. It's this world. It's Shakespeare's world. And you can enter into it physically and materially and hold yourself there. Well, I, I understand that. I've never been to Shakespeare's house, but I was into uh, one of Pablo Gula's houses. Mm -hmm. And and that, that kind of gave me that reality. You know, that, that this is what we saw. Mm -hmm. that this is where he looked at the ocean. This is. And, and so, from that point of view, it's very real. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but, but this whole thing about what's real and what isn't is kind of... I mean, that's, that's why he's a master of suspicion. That's what the Gothic asks us to question, really, is what does it mean for something to be real? And Irving's stance is, 
Why not just delight? Why not be of easy faith? Why not? Why not persuade yourself? Because it's not somebody manipulating you, right? You're accepting an invitation. The, 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 the world offers these little invitations to delight and joy. Why not? Nobody's selling you anything. It costs you nothing. Why not just make believe and enjoy it? And there's a real richness to that that almost every human being in post-capitalist America or Europe, whatever, neglects. Why not just believe it? Is, do you think that it is like Jerome Miller is responding to that when he talks about like uh, the fear of like treating everything as a problem to be mm -hmm. solved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, he's coming out of the Heideggerian logic, and all of this is heavily inflected by Jerome Miller also, so mm -hmm. very much. Right. We'll read him later on in CHI, I, I promise. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's okay. I'm glad, glad you did. Does that make more sense now? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, as he did with the history and fable in his first chapter, Irving conflates as equally important the local anecdotes of goblins and great men. <laughs> Right? Whatever these stories are, whether they're goblins or heroes, doesn't matter. They're just stories. They're anecdotes that can be enjoyed as such. Not for the point of worship, but for the point of enjoyment. To learn and to revel. Whether stories are plausible or improbable, Irving indicates that credulity can transform anonymous spaces into particular places. That's the link. That's what gives something its place, is understanding the story about it. Rather than performing the work of building, which is a labor that the logics of power and domination find is imperative in claiming new lands. When, you, when you're going to settle a country, if it's for Spain or Britain or whatever, if you build something, that's what makes it that country's. Whoever is the first to erect a structure on it wins. I mean, that's why they planted a flagpole on the moon, it's to make it America's. I mean, that's the logic, that's what it means. But so instead of that kind of logic, Irving pushes all that aside and he points to the work of persuading ourselves into the belief of local legends, investing them with an element of our own trust and a work that brings them to life. If only that life only lasts as long as the fleeting span of a daydream. That's okay. The rich potentiality of storytelling requires <laughs> the gothic work of suspending disbelief, which is how Coleridge de defined what a poetic faith means. It's the work of suspending disbelief. Poetic dwelling, being grasped by a locale rich with stories, becomes Irving's alternative to colonizing the land through the desire of certainty and control. So, a different example of the interaction of literature and space comes on page 233, after Crayon has visited Shakespeare's grave. He writes of wandering through the scenery of the Lucy estate, through which, quote, some of Shakespeare's commentators supposed he derived the enchanting woodland pictures in As You Like It. And here's what he writes about it. Here's a longer passage. Quote, It is in lonely wanderings through such scenes that the mind drinks deep but quiet drafts of inspiration and becomes intensely sensible of the beauty and majesty of nature. The imagination kindles in reverie and rapture. Vague but exquisite images and ideas keep breaking upon it, and we revel in a mute and almost incommunicable luxury of thought. It was in some such mood and perhaps under one of these very trees before me, which threw their broad shades over the grassy banks and quivering waters of the Avon, that the poet's fancy may have sallied forth into that little song which reads into the very soul of a rural voluptuary. In this passage, Irving shows the harmonizing possibilities of co-creation. Nature provides a place in which author and reader can take equal share and equal responsibility. The reader has been attuned to the scene through the truths mentioned by the author, but finds that this natural scene is adequate to inspire similar musings. Right? So, I mean, Irving's sitting out, chilling out on the country, or crayon, I mean, you know, like, he's just kind of sitting here. And he's able, on his own, to appropriate nature, being just awesome, right? I mean, he's sitting there, like, wow, this is great. And on another level, he's able to reflect and think of William Shakespeare sitting in the same way, being able to talk about the truths of what the rural life means in his poems and his plays. But his view of nature has already been inspired by such words. And those words help him be able to understand nature in a way that helps him identify with the author 
that leads him to be able to create his own language. But this passage is language that's beautiful about how to appreciate nature. How does he do it? Because he's read Shakespeare's words on how to appreciate nature. And nature speaks to him in a way that's similar to, but distinct from Shakespeare, whose words influence him and allows him to, pr to produce his own works of art that allow others who sit at that spot to say, oh, this is where Irving sat when he was writing about Crayon, thinking about Shakespeare, writing about his stuff. I mean, do, do, do you see how that works? It's a beautiful cycle. And again, this is open to everybody. It's free. Anybody can have it. So there's this is uh, okay. That's so, kind of like saying you know um, happiness is a choice. Is that just because happiness is another big term that's really hard, right? How you live is a choice. What you're open to is a choice. What you allow to make you happy is a choice. You have the choice to make your life happy, or let's just say. You can choose to be gloomy, and everything is bad. You can choose to look at things from a more um, optimistic point of view. Uh, Let me rephrase that. You can choose to be happy even if you, you have a, a very deadly disease. Yeah, and, and I think part of what Irving is pointing to is how he would define happiness is something that's liberated from a need for certainty and control, right? What, what does happen? I mean, nobody's happy if they're suffering and pain. I mean, you can be, but you can give up control over it and you can accept the fact that you're still alive, right? And you can find moments of happiness that inspire you. You can be okay. open to it, right? But it all depends on being willing to suspend the logics of certainty and control that govern our society. And it's that kind of open, like he's able to be happy here because his definition of happiness includes this kind of moment. Yeah. He's able to believe, be, believe in the chair because his definition of truth allows him to say, yeah, that can be Shakespeare's chair. I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you, I think, but I just want to predicate <laughs> that happy is such a loose term. Well, yeah, it is a loose term, but, but you know, the, the thing about control also, you know, entropy is always growing. So that, you know, it, if you want to control things, you're going to spend more and more energy controlling, and it will come a point where you don't have any more energy to do it. Yeah, and it's, it's destined to failure. Certainty is the same problem. I mean, they're, they're related problems, right? To be certain of something, it's hard to be certain. It's hard to be certain of anything. Well, you cannot really be certain. It's, uh, uh, but I'll take it too much of your time. But <laughs> I, uh, but, but there's, there's one thing that drove me into studying what I studied because I thought, you know, it was mathematics. And I thought that there you could, at least there, you could be certain that what you were saying was true or false. Okay. Nobody told me that in the 1930s, Gödel uh, proved <laughs> that no matter what you accept it as basic premises, there will always be propositions that you cannot prove to be true or prove to be false. They're independent. Mm -hmm. Then and they made a whole principle of uncertainty. <laughs> well, well, and, and it, you know, at that point, it kind of, I thought, well, maybe I got into the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. But then I, I looked at it and said, well, maybe this is an opportunity to learn more. And, and you know, that choice that that reality there uh, pre comes up it, 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 there are things that you that you couldn't prove and that you if you want to use them you have to accept them as, a, as new axioms faith you can be of easy faith in such principles and axioms you can accept them and enter into their world well there's no <laughs> way if you want to let's just say if they're independent, there's no other way that you can get to them unless you do something very different. Mm -hmm. and, and you can make a choice that your happiness will not be contingent upon anything. I, I learned that more from mindfulness. Like there was a quote that a you know a person was sitting meditating, and this you know guy came in with a sword, and he said, "I'm capable of you know drawing you all the way through with this sword and not being phased." And the meditator said. And I'm capable of being drawn through without yeah. being faced, you know. So yeah, it took in a lower, you know, and 
from another point of view. Forward. My wife always, when you call her, and she, you get her met her, her answering machine. She will, at the end she will, she says, make yourself a, make yourself a happy day because we can. And, and there's some truth to that too because I, I see people that choose unhappiness. I think. Uh going back to this idea of like sitting with William Shakespeare or not, you're not sitting, he's not physically there, but you're sitting with his words and letting them inform your experience of nature or whatever it is. There's like plenty of examples of that within the realms of unhappiness that provide some kind of satisfaction. I don't know quite what to call it, but like, like I really like the band Nine Inch Nails and they write a lot of horrible songs about depression. Okay. But, like, being able to sit with them having had some sort of similar experience to me is, I think, along the lines of what Irving is looking yeah. at. Yeah, and, and for there, too, I think that there's a distinction between, you know, if you distinguish between good, bad, happy, sad, you know, like, there, there can be sad songs that are good because they're true, because life is sad sometimes. There can be happy songs that are good because they're true, because life is happy sometimes. You know, and so I think that, that that not quite equating happy with good all the time necessarily is helpful in understanding that kind of thing. Right. I might interrupt when you think that's true. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, yeah. It's okay. All right. But I might get back to here so I can finish up the lecture in time. So going back to here in the cycle of nature, Shakespeare, world, nature, inspiration, like that that whole cycle. Um, I, I, I think that this is where the natural scene is adequate to inspire musings similar to those the author had, right? Nature itself can be a source of truth, just as literature can, just as your own mind can, right? They're all co-creating possibilities and elements. And I think that this would be the, quote, mute and almost incommunicable luxury of thought that artists are able to communicate no matter how impossible it is, right? They can open a door. It's not an absolute door. It's not a certain door. It's not a guaranteed door that works for everyone, but they can open a way to access it that doesn't program him into thinking he is Shakespeare or just rewriting all of Shakespeare's plays, right? I mean, he doesn't do either of those things, but it opens up something for him to appropriate personally in what nature is saying. So there, it, there's no need for... Irving, through Crayon at this point, to say that this is the tree that Shakespeare sat under, right? I mean, it's not, it's different from the cottage. It's a different, it's a different level. That's why we're calling it the third step, right? It's different from saying this is the tree. He's just saying, here is how Shakespeare did this. He can create, um, he, he sowed Shakespeare's seed into his own soul, and he can create his own integrated fusion of author, reader, space, and story. And that's what I think is unique about that section where he's sitting on the bank looking at the river. Does, does that make sense? It's that integration of all of those factors together that's powerful. And it requires having an author, having nature, having yourself become so familiar with that way of thinking that you can live it, and then being able to do something with it. And appropriating it isn't just following, just becoming Shakespeare. Appropriating it means writing your own book, ultimately. And that's how I think the best authors live. So, after a day spent rambling about, Crayon demonstrates the power of an aesthetic grounded in the alchemical transformation of literary spaces to places that readers can occupy, and it's a power that he invites his readers to appropriate. He attributes this third factor, the literary transformation of the world, to the poet. But what's equally notable is the way that Crayon has already embodied, as well as textually represented, this strategy. And here's a longer quote again, quote, on returning to my inn, I could not but reflect on the singular gift of the poet, to be able thus to spread the magic of his mind over the very face of nature, to give things and places a charm and character not their own, and to turn this working day world into a perfect fairyland. He is indeed the true enchanter whose spell operates not upon the senses, but upon the imagination and the heart. Under the wizard influence of Shakespeare, I had been walking all day in a complete delusion. I had surveyed the landscape through the prism of poetry, which tinged every object with the hues of the rainbow. I had been surrounded with fancied beings, with mere airy nothings, conjured up by poetic power, yet which to me had all the charm of reality. Again, it's the charm of reality. 
That's what he's interested in. Not the question of what is real, but he's, he wants the charm of reality. And he finds it through poetry. With this point, Irving gestures to a final and different feature of the Gothic's <coughs> successful deployment, one that filters our experience of his shared and otherwise mundane reality, one that's not dependent upon the symbolically determined framework of a shrine. One dwells in this as a Gothic space, explicitly invokes as such through the thematic invocation of fairyland, enchanter, wizard influence, right? I mean, all that stuff's just the Gothic language drenching that particular passage also. But he appropriates it through a carefully constructed, or, or he lives that Gothic space by appropriating a carefully constructed literary space and projecting it upon a shared reality apart from the directed implications of the text. This manifests in Irving's appropriation of Shakespeare's airy nothings, which is a line from Theseus' speech in A Midsummer's Night Dream, and that opposes what lovers and madmen are able to apprehend with what a calculating, cool reason can comprehend. Right? Lovers and madmen apprehend things. Over here, cool reason comprehends it. To apprehend and comprehend, not the same. And Shakespeare's interested in our apprehensions. So the line says from Theseus, quote, and as imagination bodies forth, bodies forth, right? Again, it's material. As imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives to airy nothings a local habitation and a name. End quote. The allusion to Shakespeare intimates that those who indulge in the rambles of literature and fall under the spell of stories wield the power that Shakespeare proffers the poet. By having appropriated and inhabited a literary world, and through a long-standing habit of making believe, Crayon consistently translates airy nothings into his local habitation. Right? Wherever he happens to visit is where he's inhabiting, and that's what helps him transform the space and make it into a place. Inviting readers to project such figures through the imagination allows that space to become a place saturated with stories suited for human dwelling. Which again goes back to Heidegger, right? And the power of language in, in governing over what a space or a place can look like. So the key, I would argue, to this mode of dwelling through the Gothic, allowing the stories and objects to open the possibility of a dispossessed life, and a possibly opening this mode of dwelling up for others, is realizing that the worlds that are thereby created are temporary and fleeting. Each moment that one spends dwelling in this way should be experienced or understood as a morsel. It's a small piece of certainty that in a short time is lost. Such domains, and only such domains, open themselves up for one's total dominion as one is, for that moment, the sole occupant of that particular place in that particular way. This mode of dwelling is antithetical to the properties or the values of property and ownership each of which seeks to exact control in a reliable, predictable, and reductionist way. Irving therefore invites us to accept our finitude, appreciate temporal limitations that grant certainty in small doses, remain open to possibilities that disclose improbabilities that grace us, and thereby expand the working day world into a fairyland. Irving intends that Crayon's rambles inspire readers to infuse their realities in more uncertain, and therefore more delightful ways. Having disclosed the human capacity to live in doubled worlds, he instructs readers to manifest this doubledness by imaginatively enhancing, instead of diminishing, the surrounding environment. Acknowledging the power of adjectives to frame one's perspective, but not demanding that this equate to certainty, and thereby avoiding, um, we'll, we'll talk about next week what Ichabod Crane does, uh, Irving's method of writing continually models how to create an enchanted life. And so he departs from despair that infects some of a Gothic literature. I mean, there's a certain hopelessness in a lot of the Gothic stories. He departs from that, and he dwells in possibilities opened by poetic moments of recreation. We make homes by appropriating the potential provided by poetry. So here's a couple of quick implications. Number one. Uh, Irving shows the importance of provisional lives. To recognize the inability to control any important circumstance, to delight in his provisional portion, and to be just as glad to relinquish the illusion of power or possession as one was to attain it in the first place. It's important because it offers a true sense of independence. It's a freedom from the burden of ownership. Number two, 
Irving shows the importance of an easy belief, a willingness to be dece deceived. It's a counter to skepticism, which is a trait that began to manifest increasingly through the 19th century of the growth of urban life. Forgetting skepticism and the cynicism that often accompanies it, one who is willing to be deceived remains open to wonder and joy <coughs> beyond measure, beyond value. It's priceless in that way, very particularly. Number three. Irving demonstrates the need to have literature become an important conversation partner in one's life. Inspired by the Shakespeare he has read, Crayon is able to co-create the world around him attuned to the text of his past. This allows him to transform not only Shakespeare's native ground, but also to see all the reality passing by through the bard's eyes. This magic also allows him to more easily become inspired by the natural world, seeing himself as part of a creative process in the same one that had initially prompted the poet's pen. Reading Irving, of course, does the same thing for us, and it can inspire us to become equally as creative as Irving, as Shakespeare, as Homer, and all the way down the line. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Interesting? Very. Yeah, that kind of leads to a particular line I really like about kind of just the toss of the dice. He says, it is often a turn up of a guy in the gambling freaks of fate whether a natural genius shall turn out a great rogue or a great poet. And had not Shakespeare's mind fortunately taken a literary bias, he might have as daringly transcended all civil as he has all Germanic laws. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it's that, it's that contingency. It's accepting that, embracing it, and reveling in it, instead of trying to thwart it. Mm -hmm. That allows us, I think, to be happy ultimately, however you define happy. Uh, two, uh, Daniel, is there a great 20th century writer poet that you think is in the Gothic tradition? Um, I mean, the Gothic just, I mean, you could look at, uh, so here's what happens. And like I said at the beginning of class, the Gothic is, is, kind of a term that's thrown onto things. In the 20th century, Gothic becomes horror. It becomes suspense or thriller. It becomes sci-fi. It becomes fantasy. <coughs> and it's, it's, I mean, they're, they're all those things. So you can look at like Stephen King as being a Gothic author. You can look at, um, oh, I don't know, like Dennis Johnson as being a Gothic author. I mean, you can look at McCarthy McCar probably is actually the best. Yeah. Um, above all, I would say he's probably the closest in some ways to capturing that grotesque, problematic vision of what reality is. And so you can read The, the Road probably as a Gothic novel. You can look at The Walking Dead the graphic novels as a Gothic reality. I mean, it's the same kind of preoccupation, but, but to call them Gothic also does them a disservice because they're not. And I think it... it, it it does too much to kind of muddy what gothic means, or because at that point you can call, you know, aliens a gothic movie, which arguably is, right? You can argue for it, but it doesn't add to the movie to call it that, and it doesn't add to the gothic to understand aliens as, as an important part of it. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you or, see any parallels of, about? people that really enjoy psychedelics because it releases an ability to better imagine some of the things that were addressed in this. That I mean, I can sit in the damn chair, but I don't feel Shakespeare, but <laughs> I, hey man, you know. Here's the way I'll answer that question, as I have no first-hand experience with psychedelics. What I'll say is this. Um, one of my teachers was a, uh, was a student of um, a, a Buddhist monk, uh, and he he talked about how this monk would be offered a whole bunch of drugs, and, and how basically he'd say, you know what, you can do it that way, but what I'm doing is already this. I'm just doing it, not the drugs, right? I'm owning my experience of what's going on, and the kinds of realities that are presented I'm presenting to myself all the time. And so, you know, he would, you know, do acid or mushrooms and he would be unaffected seemingly because that's, he had that kind of capacious openness that he had developed through his own practice of mindfulness. And so in some ways, in some ways, yeah. And in some ways, drugs can open up 
access to experiencing things differently. But what you retain of those experiences, I mean, the people that I've talked to who have enjoyed psychedelics talk about like talking to rocks for five hours and being really moved by the rock's plight by sitting here instead of there. I mean, that's good, right? You can do that and it opens up reality in a new way. But what you really retain in some ways is different. This is a harder road. It's not as easy as, as drugs, right? It's, it's, there's no shortcut to it. But I think what it gives you is something that you can own as well as experience. You can really appropriate it in a more true way. Although at the same time, I mean, it's, I mean, there are a lot of great writers who definitely were motivated by psychedelics or whatever drugs to understand different ways to perceive and understand reality. So, I mean, I, I know that there's some give and take there. I'm just, uh, Probably a little bit more biased in my Protestant upbringing than, than not. Did he not see Edgar Allan Poe write about his earlier travels? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, Poe's I mean, Poe's a master. Another Gothic writer would be uh, Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman actually, um, I mean, a lot of his short stories, a lot of his novels are, are incredibly Gothic in, in their okay. architecture and their language. Um, China Mieville, to an extent, in some of his short stories, can do the same things, and in some of his novels. But again, it's, it just it just it gets so muddy that it's hard it's hard to really place in something in the gothic it just exploded out so all right thank you